So, brethren and sisters, we're going to uh, look at uh, chapter 20 and chapter 21 in this second talk. We've covered a lot of ground, really, in terms of the, the work that, uh, that, that must be uh, accomplished when the Lord Jesus comes back and the, and the kingdom is established. And, and we've thought about all of those steps uh, that need to be uh, covered. But when we come to chapter 20, we actually uh, have moved a long way forward we've actually moved really a thousand years forward and when we come to chapter 20 we've we've got to the end of the millennium and that might seem a little bit odd to us especially as we had a couple of chapters didn't we on the destruction of Babylon and we think well why has God in Revelation written a couple of chapters on the destruction of Babylon and yet when we come to to the thing we're all looking for and the thing we're all hoping for the kingdom age there's very little in Revelation about it. We have it established at the end of chapter 19. By chapter 20, we've got the judgment at the end of the thousand years. And we would perhaps like a, you know, a few chapters of descriptions, wouldn't we, on what it's going to be like in the kingdom age. But I think God is saying, well, actually, if you want pictures of what the kingdom age is going to be like, we'll go back. Go back to the Old Testament. Go back to those beautiful pictures in Isaiah. Those psalms would describe the joys of the kingdom age. Because Revelation is about those things that are going to pertain that are of of, um, interest to the saints as they are awaiting. So we're just just looking at uh, the chapter, chapter 20 of Revelation. So the kingdom is finished. Now, now what's going to happen at the end of the kingdom? Well, of course, it is important for us to think about the age beyond the thousand years. We don't have a lot of information, but God is an eternal God. So even the thousand years is just a phase in his great purpose. And so the, 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 the rest of Revelation after chapter 20 uh, are to do with, with the glorification of the saints and the description of that. And then we, uh, we, we sort of move on into that time that is beyond the end of the thousand years. So, start of chapter 20. We've got the angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So, uh, we've now got to have another work of binding. The, the, the overt resistance in terms of the beast and the false prophet has been done at the, the end of chapter 19. But of course, there's human nature, isn't there? Human nature bridles against the things of God. So in verse 2 we're told, he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that time, he must be loosed a little while. So so the spirit of rebellion is, as it were, put away. Until the end of the thousand years. So there won't be wars, there won't be rebellions, there won't be attempted coups during the kingdom of age. Men shall beat their swords into plowshares. Men and women shall learn war no more. So the world order that we're used to, with nations having standing armies and, and might being used as a, 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 as, a, as a tool of diplomacy, that won't exist in the kingdom. You won't have to worry about destruction and death and going and fighting. It's all going to be put to one side until the end of the thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, then we have um, this, this spirit of rebellion coming back again. So we're going to deal with that and then we're going to have a look at the, the judgment which takes place between um, verses uh, 4 and 6. So at the end of the thousand years, we're told in verse 7, 
Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. That spirit of rebellion that, that, is, that is innate within us is going to be given opportunity again to manifest itself. And they, and to go out and deceive the four nations which are in the, so, we shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So there is this rebellion and then it is crushed by the Lord Jesus. So if we just think about what we've been told there. We have at the beginning of the thousand years the kingdoms of the earth being subject to the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. And, and the war in chapter 19 has, has established that, even amongst those rebellious nations. But at the end of the thousand years, there is this releasing of the spirit of rebellion. But there is also a removing of the rule of the saints. It, it is, it's almost two sides of the same coin. Before that time, during the thousand years, the saints would, would, would be there to, to damp down any, any rebellion. But now, the saints have withdrawn to the, um, to the camp of the saints. To, to allow rebellion to, as it were, uh, take uh, man's minds again. So people then have an opportunity to decide. Am I going to Resist the power of God? Am I going to fight against it in this rebellion? Or, or am I going to uh, be on the Lord's side? It talks, doesn't it, of those that rebel to be as the sand of the sea. A, a large number. We don't know what proportion of, of all those that are in the kingdom will take part. But it's going to be a large number. And it's going to be a worldwide rebellion, isn't it? Uh, Gog and Magog, well, we've had Gog and Magog mentioned before, haven't we? Normally we associate certainly Gog with with a northern host. But now it's a host from the four quarters of the world. So all around the world there will be people that, that, as it were, want to throw off the shackles of the rule of the almighty Lord Jesus Christ and his Father. You see, the the events of chapter 19 will be forgotten in their minds. And they won't have lived in the, the, the mortal age beforehand. So they won't have had experience of what it was like when men ruled the world and, and frankly made rather a mess of it. So they'll take for granted the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather like, I suppose, Adam and Eve, you know, that the, the allure of, uh, of that which would be enlightening to them, to have their own power, will take hold of mankind. And they'll think, yes, we'd be so much better if we did it ourselves. Not remembering what it was like when <coughs> mankind did do it themselves. And so there is this spirit of rebellion. And yet when that rebellion forments and comes against the city of the saints, then it will be put down. It talks about the fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. The great consumption. And then we have the second resurrection, which which gets dealt with um, a little bit earlier in the chapter. So we've got two resurrections. We've got a resurrection of the saints, or the, sorry, the resurrection of, of those that, that live now and, and have lived um, since the start of the world. That takes place before the kingdom age, before the Lord Jesus is, is manifest. That takes place when you know, we talked about Jesus coming as a thief. 
And then we've got this second resurrection at the end of the thousand years. And they are two slightly different sets of judgment. Our resurrection, or our judgment, if we're alive, is the first resurrection, or we could call it the first fruits resurrection. Do you know when we had the law, and there was the harvest, and there was there had to be the first fruits that were brought for an offering? And the Lord Jesus Christ is talked about as being a first fruits. But, but our resurrection is also a first fruits resurrection. Our resurrection is, is those of, of this age, but the great harvest will be the second resurrection at the end of the thousand years. So the first resurrection has two classes of people that are raised. A class of people that will be, by God's grace, made immortal. And also a class of people that will be condemned. Daniel 12, doesn't he, talks about many shall awake and some shall uh, be given salvation and others given condemnation. They're raised together because there is is a resurrection of faith. There is a second resurrection, which is what is being described in here, and that is a, a different resurrection, because faith won't be uh, so involved. And just on that second slide there, we've got that uh, little quotation about being first fruits. It's James chapter 1, verse 18. This, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That's what James, how James describes our salvation. We are the first fruits. So then there is the, the, the great harvest that will take place at the end of the thousand years, which we, we've got um, described uh, in this, this chapter here. So let's just have a look at exactly what it says. Verse 12 uh, it is describing now the second resurrection, whereas those earlier verses really were describing the first resurrection. Because the, the first resurrection ends in verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power, so the second resurrection is, it has no effect on them. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So those that are raised in the first resurrection are going to be the saints in the kingdom age, in the first thousand years. So let's turn our attention now to the second resurrection. As I say, it's slightly different in character. So I saw in verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, for there was not found, there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So there seem to be two sets of books that are open. There is one book which is the book of life. And then we have another set of books that seem to be a recording of the works of the population. Now why is it a resurrection of works or a judgment of works? We see faith. Faith is about seeing that which is invisible. We have faith and we believe, but our faith is because we cannot see. We see spiritually, but we can't go and speak to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't see God. We can't see the manifestation of his character. But in the kingdom age... There will be 
the manifestation of the character of God through the saints. You'll be able to go and talk to a saint and, and, and they, will, they will show it to you and tell you uh, about God. They will be able to do miraculous things. You'll be able to go year by year if you are part of the mortal population and go up to Jerusalem and worship and, and see the king. So, so faith isn't involved because they can see the things of God. So the judgment has to be a judgment of works. What did you do about it? Knowing God wanted you to respond in this way, how did you go about it? Did you do what God wanted? Or did you not? And so these books, as it were, seem to have the the works of the the individuals that live in the kingdom age. And we're not told explicitly, but it seems to be that that there's the the book of life, and the judgment takes place, and and the works of uh, the individuals are are, are considered, and then there is a decision, does one one put into uh, the book of life? Are you given life eternal? Now, verse 13 gives us a little description of the resurrection, and, you know, it talks about the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the dead and hell delivered up the dead that were in them, and they were judged every man according to his works. Um, So it's again emphasised. But that start of verse 13 actually gives us a little picture of what it will be like in the kingdom. The kingdom it's the thousand years of the kingdom aren't going to be unalloyed joy. There are still going to be sadnesses. There won't be sadnesses on, on the scale that, that we have, the tragedies that we have. But there will still be sadnesses and difficulties. Why do I say that? Well, there's very few people that, that go into a ship thinking, well, I'm going to go into a ship because I want to, I'm going to die. You go into a ship to travel, don't you? to get from one place to another. And yet the sea gives up her dead. So there has to be people who die at sea. Whether it's die and buried at sea, or whether it's a shipwreck. So there are still sadnesses. There are still things to overcome. There are still things to try people, just in the same way as we have our trials now. It won't be pure joy, but equally, there won't be that, that need for the, for the faith that we have because the Lord Jesus will be in the earth. So, there is then those that are um, found in the book of life, whose names are written in the book of life, they are given salvation, and those that are, are found not uh, to be in the book of life, they are cast into the, to the lake of fire. So this lake of fire um, has, has something else in it. So when we get to the end of chapter 20, we've really gone very quickly to the end of the, of the, of the uh, kingdom, uh, the, the millennium. Uh, in fact, it's only really chapter 20 that actually tells us it's a thousand years, isn't it? There's three mentions of a thousand years um, in, in the chapter. So it, it, is, uh, it is here that... Uh, that uh, we're told the length of the, the kingdom age. So by the end of the thousand years, we've had two resurrections, and we've had the harvest complete. We had the first fruits at the beginning, we had the main harvest at the end, and by the end of the thousand years, all those that are unworthy have been cast into um, the the lake of fire. And so we come on to chapter 21. In chapter 21 gives us this picture of a new heaven and a new earth. This is now different in character from the things that have gone before. So we're told in verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first or the former uh, in the Greek, the former heaven and the former earth were passed away. And there is no more sea. Why is there no more sea? Well, sea represents 
peoples. Represents nations. You remember we have the sea and the wave, waves roaring. That's the agitation of the nations. So there's no more sea. There's no more agitation of nations. So those things are, are now passed away. But there has been a passing away of a, a former heavens and an earth. And I think actually that there's two former heavens and earth that are passed away in uh, in this chapter. You've got the, the first heaven and the first earth passed away in verse 1, and you've also got in verse 4, the end of verse 4, the former things are passed away. What is it describing? Well, actually, the best way of looking at it is to go to the end and then work our way back. If we go to the Second of Corinthians in chapter 12, Second of Corinthians in chapter 12 has... Paul talking about a vision that he had. And he describes being in the third heaven. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such as one caught me up to the third heaven. So, so Paul is describing a vision that he has, and he says, I'm a bit hazy, quite how, how, where, how this vision took place. I can't remember, really work out whether I was a, a conscious or not uh, when this vision took place. But he says, this, this person took me up to the third heaven. How that, verse 14, sorry, verse 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for man to utter. So, Paul is taken to what he describes as a third heaven. And he says, when I'm there, I can't tell you too much about it, but um, it's a paradise and there are unspeakable words, words that I can't uh, give to you. And I think that what he's been taken to is the time after the end of the thousand years, when, when there is now no more death, there is no more mortality. And so he calls it the third heaven. So why does he call it the third heaven? Well, if we go to the second of Peter, chapter 3, we're told what the first heaven is. Verse 10. This is describing the end of the Mosaic age. So, second of Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works that are therein shall be burned up. What's he talking about? He's talking about the end of the Mosaic Age. The age that ended in AD 70, when when the Jewish heavens were burned up. And so the first heaven, the first age, goes away. And is replaced by a second age, or a second heaven. Talked of in Hebrews in chapter 8. It's It's the dispensation that we're in. And I think it is also the dispensation of the millennium age. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9. It's giving a contrast now, again, with that first heaven that we've already thought about. Not according to the covenant, verse 9 of chapter 8 of Hebrews, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the hand of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be a pe- to me a people. So this is the next heaven and earth. This is the next dispensation. 
for the nation of Israel, that hasn't come. But it is a, the dispensation that we are under. We are under a dispensation of grace, not under the law. So, that is the second heaven. And then we have what Paul sees as the third heaven. So, so this is what I think is being talked about in chapter 21 of Revelation. When he talks about, he sees a new heaven and a new earth, for the former heaven and the former earth are passed away. He's talking about the, the, the great epoch of, of, of um, the, the Mosaic law has gone, and he's also talking about now the, the, the kingdom age epoch of there being uh, a sort of a reconciliation between man and God. Uh, That's already passed away now as well. And what you're left with is a time where he talks about in verse um, 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things, it's the same word, are passed away. So we said that there would be sadnesses in the kingdom age, because there's still mortality. There's still the effects of mortality. But now at the end of the thousand years, there is no more mortality. All the beings on the earth are spirit beings. So there is no sadness. There are no more tears. There is no more sorrow. It is the the, the beautiful culmination of God's purpose. And then he goes on, doesn't he, in verse 5. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write these words, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. This is finished. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. So that is the culmination of God's purpose. A time when when God and man shall dwell together. No more barrier. No more separation. No more need for a priesthood. Because there is no more separation between God and man. And he talks then, well, there's not going to be any unbelievers and any abominable people at, at this time. But then we have this glorious vision of heavenly Jerusalem so we go down to verse 10 we're told that he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God so he shows him a great mountain Is this mountain Zion? Well, this mountain is more than Zion. Just flick back with me to, these words that we know well, but just flick back with me to Daniel and chapter 2. That sort of foundation vision of Daniel and the the image that Daniel sees uh, that that guides us in our understanding of all prophecy, uh, I think. But just remember what happens at the end of the vision. Verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces together and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, but no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So the kingdoms of men have been blown away. They've been turned into the dust. And the great mountain fills the whole earth. 
So this is the great mountain that, that we're reading of in Revelation. He carried me in verse 10, chapter 21, in the spirit to a great mountain, and a high mountain, and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. So, so, so what is being represented here? Well, this holy Jerusalem is, is a representation of, of the body of the saints. All those that through the ages, in the kingdom age and in the age that we're in, that, that, that have put their trust in God. Psalm 87 and verse 5 tells us the characteristics of the true believer. Psalm 87 verse 5. Of Zion it shall be said, this and that man was born in her, and the highest himself shall establish her. The Lord shall count when he writes up the people that this man was born there. Where does God write up the people? What book would God write in to write the names of people? Surely this is the book of life. So to enter into the book of life, we have to be born in Zion. Now, not born in Zion. Literally, we don't have to be, be born within the city walls of Jerusalem. But spiritually, we need to be born of Zion. And where is Zion? Well, this is heavenly Jerusalem, isn't it? This is coming down from heaven. And do you remember the words of the Lord Jesus to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Just turn to John chapter 3 and verse 3. Here here is um, Jesus talking to to the teacher, the, the great teacher in Israel, who has... Nicodemus has perceptively worked out who the Lord Jesus Christ is because he says um, we know that thou art a teacher come from God for no man can do these miracles verse 2 that thou doest except, and we lose it in the English version except Emmanuel only Emmanuel could do what you do, Jesus Nicodemus is is accepting who, who the Lord Jesus is And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again. And again, it's not very good in the English. If you look in the margin, it gives us better sense. Except a man be born from above. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So we have a choice. We can be born of the earth, earthy, or we can be born from above. We can be citizens of Zion, born in heaven. But only by making that second choice can we see the kingdom of God. Can we be part of this spiritual, heavenly Jerusalem that is being described here in chapter 21. So chapter 21, and and this picture that we have, is, as it were, a a, a picture of the character of all the saints that have ever lived. Sometimes we we have writers, don't we, and they'll they'll try and paint a picture of a nation, and they'll perhaps, you know, talk of give a general description of what that nation is like and, the, and they, they sort of illustrate it uh, in a few phrases to try and to, to bring about the characteristics of all those individuals that are in the nation um, Brother Thomas talks about, when he's talking about this he talks about, well, you know, in America we talk about Uncle Sam and Uncle Sam is he, supposed to epitomise you know, sort of what it is to be an American so the writers sort of say, well, you know, if you, want to, if you want to think about what an American's like, well, think of this, this picture of this fictitious man 
and that that will give the attributes. Well, well, this is a this is a God given picture of the attributes of the saints. And they're coming down from heaven, and it, it, there is given them this great description. How big is it? Well, it's 144 cubits in size. So, so, so it's a large structure. And Brother Thomas actually sort of says, well, you took all the saints and you lined them all up and you sort of made rows of all the saints and then you made sort of one set of saints stand on top of another and got higher and higher and higher. You know, you would get a big, a big body of people. So, so that's why it's a, a large structure. Um, but interestingly, it's the cube, isn't it? Verse 16. The city lies four square, and the length of it is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. And the length and the breadth and the height are equal. And where do we find somewhere whose length and breadth and height is equal? We find it, don't we? when we go to the Holy of Holies. The length and the breadth and the height of the Holy of Holies, whether it was in the tabernacle or in the temple, was always a perfect cube. And what was in the Holy of Holies? The Holy of Holies was the Shekinah glory. The glory of God and he came and met with man. It was God's dwelling place on earth. So, so in this perfect cube, you have the saints and the almighty God. The, the two, as it were, fused together. No more the separation, no more the priesthood needed, no more the veils to keep God and mankind apart. Because these spiritual ones, are actually now spirit powered they're not mortal they are immortal and they are part of the Godhead we have a description of a number of different stones don't we we have in verse 11 a jasper stone we have pearls don't we in Verse, in verse 12, 12 gates with 12 um, names of 12 people on them. And we have a description that each, pearl, each, each gate is made of a pearl uh, a little bit later on. So why do we have so many different sorts of stones being described? Well, it's Malachi, isn't it, that tells us what it is that God is doing through the ages. He is building up his precious stones. They're beautiful words. Words that are familiar to us, but I think always helpful for us to remember the process that we are going through in our lives and the process that all the saints have gone through through the ages. These shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, verse 17. In that day, when I make up my jewels. So this is the process that God is endeavouring to, to, to make with us. That he's going to make us as jewels. And what are the characteristics of those that are turned into jewels, as it were? Well, we're told, aren't we, in verse 16, they that feared the Lord. That was one of the calls that went out, isn't it, in Revelation. All those that fear me, come. The worship of God has to to begin with a fear, not not a a terror like we might have if we stood before some some great and terrible dictator, but but a fear in the realisation that that God is in heaven and we are on earth and and God is greater than us. Uh, And God has a plan and a purpose and and, and he he asks us to submit that to to submit to it. So we have to fear the Lord. 
But there's something else, isn't there? They spake often one to another. They talked about those things of God. They considered them. They talked about the characteristics of God. They gloried in, in the hope that God had given them and the goodness of God. And were sad when they talked to each other. At their own failing and falling short and how mortality got in the way of their worship. But God said that the Lord hearkened and heard it and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and thought upon his name. I haven't got time to think about thinking about the name of God. It's a whole subject in itself, isn't it? But those that would be jewels, those that are represented in this, this great uh, picture in Revelation chapter 21, have been subject to a process from the Almighty God. There's a picture of a sapphire. You've got a sapphire, a beautiful sapphire, uh, glittering and glinting in the light. But then you also have a picture of the, the sapphire which has been mined, dug out of the earth. Of the earth, earthy. And yet, from that which was hidden within a rock, by the work that is brought upon it by the jeweller, the grinding and the cutting, there comes out a beautiful tune. And this is what God wants from us. And this is what this picture represents. And the thing that, that, that uh, comes out again and again is the clarity, the transparency of this structure. Clear as crystal, it says in verse 11. Clear as crystal. Clear as glass in verse 18. Transparent glass in verse 21. And it talks about in verse 23, the glory of God shall light this structure. The first words of God in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 three. In other words, let there be light. They sum up the whole purpose of God. God wishes to manifest light in those that would manifest his light. And this is what this structure is doing in Revelation chapter 21. It is, it is showing forth the light of God. It's radiating it. But it's interesting, verse 11 tells us that the, her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. So I, I went, you know, it's wonderful, isn't it, nowadays, you can find out about all sorts of uh, things to do with uh, with stones on the internet. And I went and had, what, what does jasper look like? I mean, if it said, uh, like a sapphire stone, clear as crystal, we think, oh yes, yeah, sapphires, yes, they're, they're clear, they, they reflect the light. Well, this is a jasper, a bit of jasper there. Jasper is anything but pure. Jasper is what's called an aggregate stone. It's made up of quartz and chalcedony, the other one we had a little bit later. It's made up of two different minerals. It's an aggregate, it's pushed together. Now have a look to see what Chalcedony is, things. that's the other thing that, uh, that Jasper is made of. And that's an impure stone as well. In fact, Chalcedony is made of two s- sorts of um, crystal growths. It's made up of quartz and, and magonite. I tell you this, not because I know it particularly well, I got it off the, off the internet, but, uh, but what it, the point is that uh, the, 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 the crystalline structure of quartz and the crystalline structure of um, magonite, the other one, are different. And chalcedone, which is often in jasper, it is made up of different layers of these different crystals. And they lock together, even though they're different. Now, why would this be interesting to us? Well, well God's saying, this, this stone, this, this jasper, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be clear. It's going to shine. Let light shine through it. And yet it's made up of basically lumps of dust. 
that, that are aggregated together and pushed together. Isn't that a beautiful type of the ecclesia? We're different elements. We're just little bits of dust, really, aren't we? And God is saying, from all those little tiny components, pressed together, pushed together, then I'm going to make a structure that seemingly that's impossible. You know, if you go and get a a bit of uh, of jasper uh, and start trying to shine light through it, you're not going to get particularly far. But God says, out of this structure, I'm going to make something that is going to glorify me. and My light is going to shine through it. In fact, um, if we just turn back, we've already turned to it, but we've just turned back to Psalm 102. It's actually made evident in Psalm 102, this idea of God taking multitudes from multitudes of people and, and making them into a structure that is, that is um, a structure for him. Now, Psalm 102 um, talks about, in verse 14, For thy servants take pleasure in her, in her stones. This is the stones of Zion. And favour the dust thereof. Why, why do God's servants favour the stones and the dust thereof? If you're going to go to a great city, you don't go looking at the, you know, at the individual stones that are in the wall of, of the great buildings, do you? And you don't sort of think, oh, I'm going to have a look at the dust. Why is it? Why do the servants of God favour the stones and the dust thereof of Zion? It's because it's them. It's us, brethren and sisters. We're the dust. We're the stones that make up this living temple. We're the building that God is making. The chief cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is built uh, around his uh, dimensions. But God is building this building up. And it's you and I that are being described in this chapter 21. So these are living stones, lively stones, stones that reflect the power and the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's 12 gates, three gates down each side. Remember in Genesis, the gate to the Garden of Eden was guarded by a cherubim. So they couldn't go in to Eden any longer. But now there's twelve gates, one down each side. And there is also um, four directions, and it talks about like, on the north side, on the east side, on the west side, and the south side. And if we go and take our minds back to, to Genesis, what came out of Eden and went off into different directions? It was the waters, wasn't it? It was the river. Do you remember the river came out and then it divided into, into four heads? So you've got something that goes off into different directions. It actually is picked up in, uh, in, in chapter 22 where he tells me, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. You see, this picture of the glorified saints, I think is an amalgam of the glorified saints that are called in our age and also in the kingdom age. But, but, but those saints that will have been made immortal and have worked with the Lord Jesus Christ, their, their job is, is to take that word of life and take it out, out from just Zion, I take it to, to the whole world. So there is a, a proceeding forth of, of salvation, of life. That is what the saints will do. And I don't have an answer for this, but isn't it interesting the numbers that are used? Everything has a dimension. Everything has a number. 144 
thousand, 144 cubits, sorry, 12,000 furlongs, 12 gates. You, you get 12, you get 4, you get 3. I don't have an answer really why, why particular numbers are used. But it seems to be God is using numerical representations to describe this body of believers. And so they're enumerated, aren't they? The stones are all enumerated out. This is the first one, this is the second. It's an interesting study, again, to look back and to look at the twelve stones of the tribes of, the na- of Israel you know, that were on the priest's breastplate. You would think they would be the same as these stones, wouldn't you? But they're not. There are some that are the same. There are some that are different. Okay, and I don't have an answer as to why that is, but I'm sure there are uh, uh, as a reason in God's mind why he's done that. Interestingly, the amethyst uh, is the last one in this list, and it's actually the first one in, in the list uh, of, the, of the high priest's come. But this is a picture of the time when the saints and the Lord God are united together. So we're told in verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the Lord, glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And our mind is taken back again to to the very beginning of the record of Scripture. Because the glory of God in the Genesis account preceded the creation of the sun and the moon. When God said, let there be light, it wasn't the light of the sun that was being talked about. It was the light of the glory of God. And the sun and the moon came later. But we come to the very end of the scriptures now. And we have in chapter 22, there being no more curse. So we're told in verse 3, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And we go all the way back to Exodus chapter 28, where we have the, the description of the priests of God. Those that would bear his name. Those that would be ministers for him. And we're told that the high priest's garments were to have a crown. A crown of gold. Verse 36. Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and a grave upon it, like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And what is it that the Lamb's servants bear upon their foreheads? They bear the name of God on their foreheads. Surely holiness to the Lord. Is a fitting name for the saints to have upon their forehead. When they go out and they, they manifest God's glory to all nations of the world. Brothers and sisters, we have a wonderful hope. We have the joy of the kingdom set before us. But there is also a great work to be done in that thousand years of going out and manifesting God's glory and manifesting God's name. 
We will be kings and priests. Or a kingdom of priests is perhaps a, a better description of it. Who will go out and teach the world. To show them that the light of God is so much better than the darkness of man. That we might help the Lord Jesus Christ bring in an even greater harvest than the first fruit's harvest. When well, that second great harvest at the end of the thousand years it is brought together. And after that time there will be no more death. There will be no more pain. And there will be no more sorrow.